This time on Graveyard Cars, we're counting down the top 10 muscle moments of the last three seasons. Takes your breath it's away. It's beautiful. It's perfect. Wow. Everything yeah. from visiting Seven. celebrities. Seven. And I became an instant fan because of their attention to detail. To ultra rare cars and complete Mopar OEM start to finish builds. One of the best payoffs in the world is when you can actually drive something that your hands created. Stay tuned for the most magnificent muscle moments on this episode of Graveyard Cars. Got that car coming to get you, I'm Mark Warman, and together with the most critical man in the world, Darren Kirkpatrick. Give me a gun! My son-in-law, Josh. Oh, yeah! And my best friend, Roy. Well, all right! We bring dead muscle cars back to life, to exactly the way they were on the day they were born, if we don't kill each other. There. Oh. Oh. It's gonna be a bloodbath. Number 10 in our top 10 countdown is finishing Chris Driscoll's 1970 Plymouth AA Arcuda. That's the one that we're doing the restoration on right here. It was interesting how he came up with that I car think that years later. I think that was a phenomenal later. story. It was the first car I ever looked at when I turned 16. This is 1980. And I didn't buy the car then because it was so rough. And through fate or destiny or what have you, it found its way back in my life, and I bought the car 25 years later and didn't realize it was the same car until I started looking for some telltale signs. Same car, same missing chunk out of the hood, all the identifying marks that showed him that was the same lemon twist yellow AAR four-speed coot he passed on. And then I realized, you know, the light bulb went on. This was the exact same car I looked at when I turned 16 and didn't buy then. So how many miles did that car have on it? I think it was like 56,000 or 58,000 or something like that. It wasn't very many. That's really low. That's why that car was so pure. That's why when once we had steam cleaned the, the suspension and everything that you could see those assembly line oh, markings so well, you know. But here's what I was saying earlier. That's that factory blue assembly line marking. Just where the assembly car. guy would put a daub on there. Yeah. And... I just think that there's sometimes there's things that we don't realize because we don't have the luxury of just going in and looking at a car that's never been touched, like encapsulated. This one has a little bit of blue still on it. Like a time capsule, isn't it? It is. And they're all different, too. Oh, you know? yeah. It's, it, every it's, assembly line had different ones, yeah. and everyone had different colors. And Especially whenever you're getting all that grease and stuff off of there, and it's just it's kind of like finding a, a hieroglyphics. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Dave Weiss does a good job of documenting all that stuff in his books, and I think it's it's cool, because when he says blue, you can and you find one like this that had a little blue on it, and you go to his book, and he says which blue it is, and he's right. I mean, that's neat. It's almost like detective work on these orange paint showing that these were checked and that the uh, differential was full of oil. The numbers that go across here are washed off over the years, so sometimes they're there, sometimes they're not. We have a lot going on at Graveyard Cars. We also have a deadline coming up on Chris Driscoll's AAR CUDA. First, I have to do the unique AAR blackout treatment. At the factory, these cars used a nitrocellulose lacquer applied to the top surfaces. That gave them that suede matte finish. Today we don't have the suede toner for the lacquer, and even if we did, that lacquer won't hold up like today's urethanes do. So I made my own cocktail of black paint, flattening agent, reducer, and hardener, so that when it dries, it has the same sheen, the same look, and the same effect as the original lacquer paint, but it'll hold up for 100 years versus a couple of years. These days you very rarely see a vinyl top on a car, it's just not a popular option. But you go back into the early 70s, late 60s, it was an extremely popular option. Now, I will tell you that while I don't like them on every single car, on this AAR Cuda, it's sexy as hell, and I think it's one of the best options it could have had. Uh, now that we got the body and paint striping, headliner, and vinyl top done on our AAR, we've got it raised up on the shop crane, we're getting ready to lower it down over the front and the rear suspension, which have already been detailed to OEM specs, and that'll be one of the last things we have to do on this car. So I'm gonna loosen the purchase. There, thank you. Now a little bit more, Josh. Okay. Okay, real tight. All right. We got Chris's AAR Cuda done on time, and I decided it would be really cool if I just loaded it up on our rollback, headed up to Oregon City, and delivered it to him in person. How are you? Great. It was very nice. Beautiful. So Mark was good enough to bring it back. 
I was blown away. It's absolutely stunning. In his particular his case, role. he wanted to do his own engine, his own transmission, right? His own his own electrical, his own under the hood stuff. Are you sure it wasn't because he was cheap or didn't trust you putting the rest of it together? No, I think he trusted me. He was blown away. You can see in the video when he looked at it, he damn near had a heart attack when he saw the paint on it. It was that beautiful. Yeah, I knew it was a, a good car, you know, underneath. So this is a second life for it. And, this is right now. I couldn't be happier. Number nine in our top 10 is getting the engine running for the 1970 Challenger RT sunroof car. So you rattle can that engine with <laughs> engine paint? <laughs> Don't rattle can engines around here. It's acrylic urethane, PPG, single stage. Designed for high heat? No, this particular stuff is not because the block doesn't need that. What the block needs to do is to be able to be sprayed in a color that after it gets ran for six months to a year, it actually has the natural shine of the original paint. So basically what I've done is I put all the rest of the exterior bolt-on items on it. I left the clutch fan off of it because we just got a new Easy Run engine stand and this, for the very first time at Graveyard Cars, is gonna be initially started before it actually goes in the car. So you do have to leave some things off to do that. I like the engine run stand because oh. it saves us so much time. Oh. So much time, days, weeks. You remember you put a whole engine together, you put it in the car, you crank it over to find out there's something wrong. Something you forgot. Oil filter adapter leaks. Yep. And you get right yeah. to it. Yeah, oil filter adapter leaks on the LA engines. What do you do on the engine run stand? You just walk over to it, tighten it down, snug it up, you're done. Exhaust, fuel, distributor, carburetor, throttle, brackets, filter, hoses, water pump. All it needs is oil and water and it's ready to run. Okay, here we go. $100. $100. Do you think I owe Darren money for that? Yes or no? Just I just want a simple. Yes. Yes. You honestly believe that, Josh? Yeah, man. I mean, the more? dude could use new clothes. Mother. <laughs> the only reason the engine didn't fire off on the very first bump, uh, which is also why Darren took the hundred dollar bet, he had disconnected the positive wire to the coil, so it had no power to it. Now, if it starts on the first There's no crank, bet. Yeah. You already bet. You lost. You took the wire off to the Nobody coil. Nobody said I couldn't. You should have kept your crap hooks, your your turd beaters, off of my off of my equipment and on your own I stuff. I thought we were part of GYC. You're not part of anything. Yeah, this is a lot better. It'll start. start. You got timing gas. When we got back, when we got the fuse in it and I hit the key, it was just like the first time it started right up. I mean, I bumped it. I whispered on it. It'll be a lot easier now. We put it in the car. It's gonna work. It's beautiful. No leaks. Love it. A lot different in the old days, huh? Any good against karate? <laughs> How about jujitsu? Mark, are you fing kidding, dude? It represents everything that was great about Detroit. They knew how to make their cars back then. Hey, Mark, I'm no! Hang I'm on, no. I'm not doing no. it! We're counting down the top 10 muscle moments on this episode of Graveyard Cars. Number eight on our countdown is finally getting the 71 Phantom Cuda off of the dipper. Since my client bought it three years ago, it's been buried in the ground, it's been flooded, uh, it's spent uh, countless hours behind uh, another vehicle being pulled from place to place and being moved from shop to shop. It's spent hours on the frame rack. I might section it. Whatever. I don't know the story of the car. There's been 50,000 different stories of how it actually wrecked. So it was the day after the 4th of July. He went out around the Ford truck, and he was going hard, and he got up to about 100 miles an hour. The old Ford truck started to come out up. You know, it was done. It was winding out. And then he darted over. When he darted over in front of the truck, say, yeah, look at me. I'm the best. He just oversteered. And that's what sent it careening into the embankment on one side, shot it across the road to the other side, and then had it sitting in the middle of the road. Look at this. Doesn't that look like it went sideways well, into a pole? It's a pole or a tree. That's, that's the kind point. of impact you get from that, yeah. That's my point exactly. We're going to go check out the crash site of the 71 440 CUDA to see if there's anything uh, that uh, the CUDA hit, maybe a, a telephone pole or a tree. I pulled the directions out. Um, you know, Mark gave me directions for whenever we got there to do certain tasks. And of course, you know, it was condescending. Morons. Look at Fender and compare it to any trees or poles. I wish I could have done this myself, but I'm busy. Saving the world, Mark. <laughs> I didn't think it was condescending. I thought I thought that it was just a well, way to make sure that it got addressed to the right people. I'm not gonna attempt to jump the ditch. 
Well, it, it was a tough call because when Darren and I went out there, I looked for an area for it to hit, you know, on one side and then ping over to I the know, other side. I know, I just, didn't see that it either. It didn't seem right. But it's been 40 years, right? 30 years. So I don't know if there was, I don't know if the road was lower because if it was any lower, they paved it a couple of times because the gouges weren't there. Right. So uh, yesterday I got a voicemail saying that we were green light go for the dipper for the 71 Cuda. What concerns me is that car comes out of the tank and the only thing on the end of the hook is the seat belt I forgot to unbolt. I mean, I, I'm done. Okay, bye. My worry, my big fear was whatever asset it is they use in some of those places to dip them, that it eats the metal. And that's what my concern was. I wanted something that wasn't gonna be that caustic. God. I mean, why is it every thing has to happen this way? I'm gonna look like some kind of a psycho, lunatic, whatever. Well, okay. You know what, it ain't, there is no okay. What you, you handle it. You can't just leave, man. Mark, are you fucking kidding, dude? Well, nobody was nobody was here for whenever you had your your little moment. Well, I'm sorry. It was just me. And you know, like I I can totally understand, you know, of course, but it it, it threw me off guard. Well, I mean, it's, it's got a lot of having a nervous breakdown. Nervous breakdowns take Darren, you've had two of them. They take time to build up to, right? You don't just have one. Mine was just a vapor lock. Mine was just stressing out. A vapor out, lock. You know, just when things build up a little bit too much, you got to purge some steam. Are vastly superior to the alternative cleaning methods that damage items, et cetera, et cetera, from sandblasting, acid dipping, and hand stripping. Um, I just want to let you know, man, that Darren and I came across uh, another dipper. So it ended up what the difference was uh, between the rest of the dippers, and it was amazing he was in Portland, was that he doesn't use acid. We're going to Portland, will I ride? And so the solution that he uses, and he uses heat, it didn't actually affect the, in the integrity of the metal. It was a good call. I had looked all over. I don't know how Tweedledum, who can't find his way around Google to save his ass, found that thing, but it was a, it was a good thing. My name is Mike Walton, and I own American Metal Cleaning. Uh, we're located in Portland, Oregon. Mark called me, and he has a very valuable rare car, a CUDA, that he needs uh, completely paint stripped and all the rust removed. Well, I'm, I'm very excited that the car came back unmelted and no holes in it. A lot more came back than I thought. I think it's a good car. I think it's a good starting point, and uh, good, if it good. hadn't came back as good as it did, I think I'd have really been in trouble. Which I would have made your guys' fault anyway, so. Didn't get a word in anyway. Yeah. Nice head. And coming in at number seven on our top 10 countdown is the disassembly of the Hemi 1967 GTX convertible. When Brett and Aaron showed up this morning, it was great to meet with them. I decided I wanted to give them a quick tour of the shop. My name is Brett Torino. I'm Aaron McLeese. Aaron and I work together uh, in a collection that I own, and uh, primarily Mopar cars. I've had a love for Mopar ever since I was a young man. One of my favorite cars is sitting behind me right now, which is why we're here. Aaron had uh, reached out to me on Facebook because Brett had seen the show, really enjoyed it. Liked mostly the attention to detail that we have on the cars. That's what really spurred him on to want to bring us his favorite car, which is the 67 GTX convertible. I, in my opinion, I think it's probably one of the most sleek and sexy cars that we do have. You know, this GTX, it represents everything that was great about Detroit. You know, it's a Hemi, it's a four-speed car, it's a big car, and I just love it. I mean, it's just, you know, there's certain things that you love. This car I love. I just, I love everything about it. I love the way it rides the looks, and it's just a gorgeous car. The one thing that you are not to touch, Mark, because there are a lot of holes in the desert in Las Vegas where we're from, you don't touch the exhaust. Aaron made it perfectly clear for us not to touch the exhaust, yeah. not to alter it in any way, shape, or form. Yeah. What it is, he loves the sound of it. Yeah. It's not a factory system. Probably every car they got down there has factory systems on them, which are cool, but when you get one out of the ordinary like that one, has the Flowmasters on it, Absolutely loves that system. It has their own sound. Loves it. It does have its own sound. So he wants it, no matter what, it has to come back with the same sound. So I'm just going to, I'll keep his old system. I may even just restore it and put it on because it didn't have that many miles on it. No matter what, that's why we recorded it. That's why I had uh, Audio Boy go out there and make sure that the decibels at the same RPM, with the same environment, will have the exact same sound. Hopefully it just runs a little better than it did before. Ain't no 
Nobody knows nothing cooler. Stop. Stop it! Stop it! Take it! Break it! That car would have been smashed at the wrecking yard and turned into a soup can. We're counting down the top 10 muscle moments on this episode of Graveyard Cars. Coming in at number six in our top 10 countdown is a 71 Charger RT 446-pack automatic in green. We're assembling the 71 Dodge Charger today, um, working on the air grabber setup. It's a very intricate piece. Basically, it uses a trap door that opens up and allows cool air to get into the motor, and that increases the performance of the engine over the hot air that normally goes in. I know you're not a B-body guy, but you got to admit, especially in the 71, 72s, the hood's cool. I thought the hood was really cool. I mean, it, it, it's really catchy, and especially that, that uh, now was it like the slug that was on the side of it? Is that what it was? A slug? What? Well, no, that's what it looked like on the side of it. Like, there's the ones that have the shark's teeth, shark's and then teeth. there's the other one. <laughs> I want to be in the office with the guy from the design team walks into the board of directors and says, Guys, I'll knock we've been trying to too. come up with an idea that screams fast. Something that really, just with one graphic, like Mark Twain said, a picture's worth a thousand words. I got it. This is the one that's going to show you what a <laughs> 390 horsepower, 440 Magnum, 71 Charger RT does. All right, take a look. That looks different, Josh. It's a slug. <laughs> slug, that is different. What the no, Yeah, no, no, dude, that's what I've seen, crazy. man. There's a thing, and it has goggles, and it's on the side. What is it? Have you ever seen a slug, a slug with goggles? <laughs> no, I'm serious. No. This is such uh, If you had a Dodge version, it was called a Ram Charger hood, so you got the really cool Ram Charger decals with the B. I'm going to hope Darren doesn't bug me while I do it. Good thing I had my Wheaties. It's like full bore right there. It's up all the way right there. OK, let go. Thanks. That was good, too. Coolest cars in the world right there. Nobody else did anything cooler. So cool. Only Mopar, baby. Only Mopar. There it goes. Ain't nobody made nothing cooler. Ain't nobody made nothing cooler. Look at that. That is awesome. OK, we know Josh loves it because it had a slug on it, <laughs> whatever reason. Why do you like the Ram Charger hood or the air grabber it's hood? It's in intimidating. <clears throat> Pull up to a traffic light or something. And yep. Got that guy beside you. And the guy's girlfriend is looking at him, well, your car got that out of your Camaro? He goes, nope. And she gets out, goes around, goes and gets in with him. But she wants to ride with a Mopar. That actually great never happened to me, but I never had a, an N9671. I did have girlfriends. My personal liking has always been the 70 and the 71 Charger. It was truly one of the coolest and most unique cars that they had ever built. It was very daring body style for it. Um, it went on to, to have the optional Hemi in it. 446 pack, you could have got a 444 barrel, 383 Magnum. I think just nearly every engine could even have it with a 340 in it or a slant six. I think it's one of the coolest ones and one of the most tempting and daring styles of its day. That car in some cases would have been smashed at the wrecking yard, recycled and turned into a soup can. And because of the passion that we have here at Graveyard Cars, we were able to find the car, bring it back from the dead, restore it to OE standards, and today, I get the luxury of driving it down the road. Coming in at number five on the top 10 countdown is professional wrestler Bill Goldberg and his 1968 Plymouth GTX convertible 444 speed. I just found out, day before yesterday, your hero, Bill Goldberg, will be here on Friday. Bill Goldberg was a huge idol of mine. He still is. And the fact that I get to meet him is, I mean, what do you say? For as big a guy as he is and as oh, strong as he about? is, and as much you know prominence as he has in both the entertainment community as well as the automotive, I thought he was a really down-to-earth guy. Bill Goldberg's is a 1968 um, GTX, Plymouth GTX, with a 440 numbers matching engine, four-speed, four four 354. Speed. How are you? It's a pleasure. Good to see you. Finally meet you. How you doing, big guy? Give me a hug, dude. Nice Josh to meet Rose. you, sir. Yeah. Stock nice to meet you, Royal man. Royal Gayland Yoakum. How you doing, sir? Good. Very nice to meet you. Take care and of that And the infamous. How you doing, sir? Nice yes! to meet you. Yes! Stop it! Please. Stop it! Take him! Yeah. Break it! Break it! I like to watch all the new car shows that are out, and I became an instant fan of Mark and the guys here because of their attention to detail. Uh, we've got yours down here. You probably recognize that. Oh, yeah, I recognize That's that. That's a I beautiful car. every night there for a while. 
I was very lucky to make it to a point where I could pull my wallet out and buy something that I wanted. And what I wanted was a Mopar. And the first Mopar that I bought was that 68 GTX convertible. You know, I didn't understand exactly why you shaved your eyebrows, and I caught that. The second you walked in the door, your eyebrows were gone. Which was a long time ago. Did you shave ago. your eyebrows? Yeah, which was a long time ago. No wonder they jump your ass all the time. What How the tall f big were you then? Yeah, I did. They got crazy what again. <laughs> Look at you all Dude, red. Hold on a second. You're starting to rag on me, and you have no freaking eyebrows? <laughs> yeah. But anyway, seriously, you might want to watch your car and your parts. You got it. Did you do that chip right there? No. Yeah. I really you sure? Did. I really didn't. Darren is no different than he is on TV. Drawing no. the With eyebrows <laughs> on Darren. I would have to say, You yeah, look like whenever... Uncle Leo from Seinfeld, dude. Yeah. That's messed up. Did you notice it took two of you to do it? Good, mine is a 3 version. He told you about the eyebrows. You wanted to do it your way, do it your way, okay? <laughs> I don't care. But he's not gonna spend the rest of the day with you without some eyebrows. What do you think of Goldberg's car? I love it. it and it suits him good, too. Same I way. love Goldberg. It was a childhood dream come true. He was a golden guy. Darren? I think he's a very nice, very he nice. He was a good person. Good I person. think he's a good-hearted guy. We're, we're blessed enough to be able to meet people like that and interact with people like that just because we happen to be the best Mopar restoration technicians the world has ever known. They knew how to make their cars back then. Boom, it starts. Timing's on. Handful of guys in the world could do that. We're counting down the top 10 muscle moments on this episode of Graveyard Cars. Coming in at number four is finishing the 1970 Sunroof Challenger. You gotta admit, you love the color of the Challenger. I mean, I know you're a pessimistic SOB, but that is your color, FC7. The purple is the prettiest color of all the Mopar colors. Not just because my Challenger is FC7 plum crazy, but it is the prettiest color. If you just get the car, it's just for the visual impact, purple is the prettiest car. I agree. That's it was the number one car. It was the number one color on yeah. all those Challenger. On the Challenger, yeah. On the Challenger. The single hardest thing was that sunroof. And if I ever do another sunroof car, I will charge exactly $10,000 extra if it has a sunroof, even if it's all there. Everybody okay? Everybody okay? Yeah. Everybody okay? Everybody's fine. Having Tony come out is great. It's an extra set of hands, knowledgeable hands. You get a lot of visual reward out of the interior going in. But starts yeah, to look, in, a starts to look like big. a finished car, yeah. Yeah. This thing looked completely flawless. All the hard work and dedication didn't mean squat until he pulled up in that thing. And I mean, it almost brought a tear to my eye. It was beautiful. You know, I drove as a teenager and, and young 20s, and I drove them back then, but really didn't have the appreciation for them that I've developed over the years. It's always fun to drive the cars. I always worried about it getting wrecked or crashed. Nothing happened to that one, which was good. So it was a good day. It was, it was a fun time. It always brings back memories from the past. Being able to drive this car was so much fun. You know, I know I wasn't born back in that era, but they knew how to make their cars back then. It was, it was incredible. Takes your breath it's away. It's beautiful. It's just sinister. It exploded. And just that tree blew hot water, boiling water out all over everything and everybody. We're counting down the top 10 muscle moments on this episode of Graveyard Cars. Coming in at number three on our top 10 muscle countdown is revealing the 1971 Tribute Phantasm Cuda to A. Michael Baldwin. Don Coscarelli. As soon as the owner said that he wanted to do a Phantasm tribute car, I fell in love with the idea. I mean, he, he wanted to modify it a little bit from the original. Growing up exactly like you on that movie and just loving that car, we loved that car. And that car, being it got the shaker, being it got the rear window louvers, that it was a quadruple black with leather guts, just was a stunning car. Every time you put a piece of trim on it, the car just came to life a little bit more. So when the is. whole car was done, you saw it roll around the corner. It's just sinister. It exploded. It absolutely sinister, exploded. Man. So today we're working on the 71 Cuda 340. We're going to assemble the front suspension and K-member. Uh, earlier in the week, we disassembled it, uh, cleaned it, inventoried it. Uh, but that process is now done, and we're going to start bolting it together. 
In the case of an OE restoration, everything has to be OE. Not just the nut and the bolt and the washers and all the hardware that go on something, but the finish and the fit and the date codes, all of those things have to mimic whatever year that car was put together. That makes putting an OEM drivetrain together about 8,000 times harder than putting together some small block Chevy with a power glide behind it. I'm gonna move this, watch your fingers, gentlemen. Ow! I'm gonna move this. Give me a little bit of time. Watch your fingers, gentlemen. I'm gonna move this. Watch your fingers, gentlemen. Ow. Give him a little bit of time. Darren and I are gonna be in here working on the 340 so we can get it painted and installed on the new K member. So we are done with the final assembly of the motor, transmission, bell housing, and shifter assembly, as well as the rear axle and leaf springs. So now we just have to push it inside the assembly room, put the final inspection line markings on, and it's ready to be installed in the car. Well, that was also fun to be a part of uh, whenever we got that transmission put together. You learned about something four on speed. that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And you got to play the part of Van Gogh at that point you know with a little brush set. That was fun. For the guy at the beginning of the assembly line to let the guy at the end of the assembly line know that all the bolts for the shackles had been tightened down, he would put a swatch of paint on there. So I try to mimic that exact same look on my cars today. So when I'm bragging about something being OEM, it's as close to OEM as you can get. So today, we get to raise the car up in the air, lower it down around its original drivetrain for the first time in years, and make this car whole again. Okay, I have made one promise to all of our followers on Facebook. I would reveal who chipped the 1971 344 speed Phantasm homage car in season two. All of a sudden, uh, Bob, good looking Bob, finds a chip on the right door. Who did it and who covered it up? Josh, you got anything you want to say? Darren chipped the car. Darren? What? You got anything you want to say? I'm just being did honest. Did you do it there, Chrome Dome? Uh, it's all right. Maybe. I already know the answer. I think it's fair for you to tell those guys. Yeah, I did it. Not on purpose. But you let me take the blame for it at least once a year mm -hmm. or two? Well, here's the way the pecking order works. You were in charge, so you were responsible for it. So they're going to kill you me now? You were in charge, Darren. As a responsible person, it was your job when you picked up that chip and realized it happened. It was your job to tell me that it happened. With only three days left to get the car done in time for Coscarelli to get out here, um, we're a little bit concerned. There's, I've done a lot of work on it, but there's still like 25 things left to do underneath the hood. You know, with everything that was going on, with the fact that they had actually showed up, and we were down to the last couple of minutes, <laughs> literally, they pull in, and we we're still detailing the car. the car on the other side of the shop. We're buffing it, waxing it, getting it ready, while they're on the other side. And I'm telling my song and song and dance dog and pony show, you know, well, Coscarelli called me out on it. He, he said he smelled something fishy. The only person here I've seen so far is Mark, and I hear some like banging and sawing back in the other room. I think something, something fishy's going on. I think the car came out stunning. I'm gonna say it takes your breath it's away. It's beautiful. It's perfect. Wow. It's got the elastomeric bumpers. Uh -huh. The vinyl top real, really wow. looks sweet. Wow, yeah, yeah, yeah. The louver windows. Yeah. Got the wing. This thing's beautiful. It is just <laughs> awesome. Wow. It really is awesome. I kind of think it was funny that Don and, and Michael were t started to pick apart the things that were wrong about the car. All right, Don, I see several things about the car that are not at the tribute okay, I, level. I, I didn't want to bring that up. I think it was a yeah. Phantasm tribute car. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So no. I think we should check off the things that are not tribute. Oh, okay. yeah. First thing is the flared fenders in the back, Don. Tell That's us about that. That's true. We had, uh, that. we had flared wheel wells, yes. Mark. Those the pinstripe. The pinstripe's important. Yeah, the pinstripe's Bill important. Thornbury's brother What's actually Bill painted the pinstripe. The sunroof. Oh, yeah, the sunroof. All in all, I think that to that date, that was probably the most rewarding build. Got to meet Don Coscarelli, Michael Baldwin. We did a beautiful Phantasm homage car that'll stand the test of time. And we did it all on time, on budget, and we win. What else do you want? Numbers matching FC7 in Violet, 70 Roadrunner. You would have used the incorrect one to be only correct. Hey, Mark, I'm no. I'm Hang not, on, I'm not no. taking it. We're counting down the top 10 muscle moments on this episode of Graveyard Cars. Number two in our top 10 countdown is a 1970 Plymouth Roadrunner. Hands down, my favorite car. 
the very first car that we finished, 1970 in Violet FC7 383 Roadrunner. Everything is gonna be exactly the way this car came off the assembly line in 1970. You know, and the other thing is when we had that car, <laughs> we had nothing. We had just moved into this shop. We had no equipment. We had no lifts. We had nothing. That's why we used the forklift to install the drivetrain the way that we did. Season one was appalling. And all I had is my creative genius, you know, to try to carry it through. I must That's have blinked just... and missed that part. All of 68 and through December of 69, Chrysler had a problem. This was, this was an erroneous label that they had put on the temperature gauges. So it read wrong. They corrected it in December of 69. And so since my Roadrunner was a 70, it should have that correct one. If you had a 68 or an early 69 model with the same dash, you would have used the incorrect one to be OE correct. I'm surprised you guys didn't know that. <laughs> you remember that was when we had the gauges in here and we laid them all out on there? And I remember that was the one where I showed how the fuel gauge worked and I mimicked what you was like as a kid. And I touched the little thing and I say, Daddy, I'm out of gas. And then I'd hit it more and the gauge would go up. Here, yeah. son, take my visa and go fill your tank. Because you spoil, you know? Me, I was, well, man, I wanted to get gas from Dad. I had to go out to Buell Chapel, dig his ass up, rob his wallet, you know what I'm saying? Dad. There it is. Darren, you can take the credit for it. I, I didn't do it. Mark did all the detail work. We all pretty much assembled it. I just came along and found the faults in both of them and fixed them. Before? After. That's sort of Mark is before, I'm sort of the after. You know what I'm saying? I want to buff the taillights so you can put the taillight assemblies together okay. and in the car. Yeah. Josh, did you really acid these? These. Yes, I swear to God. Which I, I can walk up to seat. right here and go like that, and it rubs the dirt right off. The bottom line is I did acid them, but I did not acid them to mark standard. Did you use this acid? That's the only acid did we have here okay. in the shop. You didn't you use this burn? acid. Cuts. That's no. No, okay. okay. Did you find the bolt for the horn? Doing wrong. I'm taking these. them off your car. No, no, you're not. No, Mark. Hey, Mark, I'm no. I'm Hang not. on, I'm not no. taking it for that. I'm not taking no, it for that. No, you're not taking it for I'm not. I'm taking it to match it. Why are you coming at me like you did so horribly, so awful, <laughs> so mean, when I was just trying to get a sample of what they looked like by borrowing your horn bolt? You knew what they looked like. No. See, that's why I needed it in my hand, because I didn't want to walk back and forth a thousand times. See, it has these serrated edges right here. Yep. Nice. And then you come along later and just accuse me, just erroneously accuse me of stealing. You know, stealing is a crime, man. There's just certain bolts, certain nuts, certain finishes that have to go under the hood of the car to be OE correct. That's what we specialize in here. I was gonna take one off of Darren's car, but he caught me right in the middle of it, so I kinda had to put it back, but I told him I was using it for a sample, which I wasn't. I was gonna borrow it forever. It says, Voice of the Roadrunner. That's the official sound of the Roadrunner. <laughs> One of the neatest features on the 70 Roadrunner was that reflective tape just above the rear body panel. It adds a lot of character to the car, especially at nights when headlights and things are hit, it would just basically light up. Meet me. 70 Roadrunner, I tippity tap it, I give it a little kiss. I whisper on the ignition switch and it fires right up. Bizoom. It's that TV. was the argument. It's TV. It doesn't really happen that no, way. No, it did happen that way. You were right there when it happened that way. One crank. Boom, it starts. Timing's on. Handful of guys in the world could do that. Eight guys in the world could have done I'm that. Mark, there's a lot of people, but go ahead. No, there's not. Set the idle up. Put the whole car together, the body, the paint, the interior. Detail the suspension, the OE specs. Why not? I'll tell you what. Decals, a full screen, flat, and it starts. And then you got burned. <laughs> Yeah, see, that's what happens when you do evil things. No, that's what happens evil when things come in it. Ignition, key, turn, crank, start, pow, best, world, burn. That's how it works, <laughs> OK? You're the damn devil, and it came back to you. The hose just completely blew off the radiator, and <laughs> apparently it shot radiator fluid all over Darren's back. And just that like, tree blew hot water, boiling water out all over everything and everybody. Maybe it's the starting instructions that hang on the turn signal switch or the locking ignition sleeve that goes over the visor. Maybe it's a combination of all these things. But when I slide behind the steering wheel of a car that I just finished, I have the exact same feeling that I did that day when I drove my Charger home for the first time. And I think it's that motive, not money and not trophies, 
that force me to do the very best job I can at recreating history one car at a time. Don't you guys agree getting a 70 Roadrunner done was a real momentum here for three of our cars? It was a milestone to get, the, you know, the first car, like I said, not only, you know, coming back to life, but then being able to enjoy it and drive it. Be able to take it out, be able to, to, to do Brodies in it, to be able to do burnouts in it and stuff like that. It, you know, I, I think that's a, one of the best payoffs in the world is when you can actually drive something that your hands created, you know. I think it's awesome. Um, brought the first car we brought back to life. It's the first car we brought back to life, and not only did we bring it back to life, but we filmed every square inch of it, and people got to see it going down the road for the first time in, I don't remember, 30 years, 25 years. Numbers matching FC7 in Violet, 70 Roadrunner, 383 Automatic. We transformed the car from a withering rust heap of nothing to a first place show winning representation of 1969. We're counting down the top 10 muscle moments on this episode of Graveyard Cars. Coming in at number one is Tom's 1969 Charger Daytona R4 Red White Wing and White Gut. The Dodge Daytona is one of the coolest cars Chrysler ever built. It was their car to qualify at NASCAR. If you were gonna build a car and race at NASCAR back in 1969, you had to make at least 500 street versions of the car that you'd like to race at the track. Most companies, that deterred them from getting too far out there with uh, airfoils and wings and but you get into a Charger Daytona and a Plymouth Superbird, you have three foot tall wings on the back, airfoil noses. They were an amazing testimony to how much a manufacturer believed in their product back in the day. I'll tell you, when it comes to the Daytona, if there's any regret I have in this world, it's answering the phone that bright and early morning. Hi, Welby's. God, there it went. Tom Partridge. When I was a kid, I didn't know what they were. I just thought they were a big, cool car with a big wing, and I loved them so much that I was in this group with my dad called the Indian Guides, and we built Pinewood Derby cars, and I had him actually make me a Pinewood Derby car with a big wing on the back. There wasn't much to disassemble. The car was pretty much disassembled. Yeah. There was two bolts holding the dash in. I think doors. it Doors. Yeah, doors, yeah, the jack nose, lid. The nose cone was inside, I didn't have a box too. in there. I don't remember. The rest of it was all in, a block. Uh -oh. in, in boxes. So the disassembly was a piece of cake. Once it was disassembled, it was just a matter of sending it down to have it media blasted. So the paint scheme on Tom's car, was it the back half painted on it? First of all, it's R4 red, okay? And that's a beautiful red, scorch red. Originally, it was a single stage enamel. That's how the cars were painted, right? Except that part of them were done in lacquer over at Creative Industries. But Tom didn't want it to look as crappy as they did from the assembly line. So what we did was we did our base coat clear coat, DBC with clear coat polyurethane clear over the top of it. And it's like anything, you gotta get those panels completely flat. So rolling it in the booth, you know, if you have all that stuff done, then when you start spraying that red, it shows instantly. It's like carpet that covers up a multitude of sins as that red paint goes on there, and it's absolutely stunning. You didn't answer my question about the white stripe around the back. Most bumblebee stripes, which that's kind of like a bumblebee stripe because it goes around the back half like oh, a bumblebee. Oh, that was a vinyl stripe. That's a vinyl, oh, it's a vinyl okay. decal. Yeah, we got that from Phoenix Graphics. The other thing is too, the stripe does not match the graphic. The actual hmm. wing itself, you would think, should match it perfectly. Oh. Absolutely not. So that whole back of the car is its own enigma that you have to That's dig crazy. through. Who's that? Oh, it's, oh, it's Uncle Fester. <laughs> it's Tom. Got the whole tribe with him, too. 469 wow. Charger Daytona. <laughs> That's for, That's cool. That's crazy. It that, looks so good. Can I touch I it? I can't sure. paint job on this. It's like candy. It looks wet. Wow. With any of the reveals, in this particular case, the car wasn't done, but the big portion of it was. When his family came out there with his, his girlfriend and the two kids, and they just, you know, you could see them light up at it because it's, it's stunning. It was in this room right here, and the lights were on it, and it just blows you away. Last time that we saw the car, it was just, it didn't even roll. He pushed it home, and it was a pile of junk. Now it's gorgeous. Okay, line me up in those fronts. Roll over. I can't see everything. No, I'm just looking forward to it. Uh, we're so close. The finish line is approaching. Not to use a pun with a car. I think the whole reason that the car fell off the jack was Darren's fault. Who set the jack? I wasn't here. Royal set the jack. I wasn't and here he didn't that day. Put... Well, I'm going to be eating popcorn this week while the rest of them are working on the cars. Want some more? Mm -hmm. 
Can we get the car outside? Stop with the popcorn! <laughs> oh my god, dude. So I'm looking forward to a productive week. Now, out the door. Out the door. Be my eyes. I'll watch this side. You watch yours, Josh. How are you looking over there, buddy? No, man. This is a start to the week. I said put it on that skid plate. And, and you just did it your own way. You put it in front of the skid plate and you put some extra wax on it, some lemon pledge so it'll slip off. <laughs> I think you were here, bud. And he wonders why I self-medicate. <laughs> no, sh happens. And when you're surrounded by toilet flies, it happens even more. <laughs> the front K member came loose off the floor jack when Mark was trying to scoot it across the floor. The damage could have been a lot worse. No, I think one of the greatest reveals on that car was when the dash showed up from Instrument Specialties. One of the what best hookups we ever made oh, right there. It looked brand new. Yep, look at that. Oh, my God. Wow, that's got... Oh, my. Put the dash in, it looks great. It looks beautiful. Probably better than new. Yep. That right. looks good. That looks that fantastic. Looks really Absolutely. Absolutely. Better than new. Well, and it just changes the car instantly. Better look at it. Better than new. Equally with instrument specialties, when you talk about things coming together, there's legendary. Well, we took the seats down to bare metal, had them media blasted and primered and painted. And then we had new burlap and new padding put on before the seat covers went on. I called Mike Celeste. I told him that we were going down hard. And out of the kindness of his heart, he sent his guy out to help us put that car together. I'm Ron Halbritter. I've been doing these interiors for about 27 years. Mike called me into his office last week and said uh, Mark had a situation out here where he needed the car put together and he wanted the, uh, one of the best to do it. So we flew out and we're giving Mark a hand with us. Uh, them together and uh, it's gonna look sweet. Once that interior was installed, the car was real. It first, it became real and it became beautiful. That car right there is gonna be on the road today, driving for the first time in probably 30 years. You know, I, I love those cars. When I was a little kid, there was a hot rod magazine with a Daytona in it. And I remember the article because it said that it had a Hemi in it. And it said that when it idled, it, like, it was like a coffee can full of rocks. Oh, I, I read that, yeah. Did, Tin can full of yeah, rocks or something, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, that's when I started falling in love with the wing cars. I thought they were really cool. Who's the dream maker, though? Tell them that. Tell, You're yeah. the dream maker. Who made your dreams come true? You did. It, it was rewarding to drive that car down the road and know that it's been a long time since that one was on the yeah. highway. A long time. And Tom over there, you know, grinning ear to ear like a Cheshire cat because he was legitimately happy. All of his worrying and all of his fears all, all went to rest when we were driving down the road in that car. So uh, we got to take it down and do some burnouts with it. He just had a blast doing that, and, like a kid. You know, he couldn't wait to do that. Uh, driving down the road in that car is amazing. Had the park lights on, and I mean, thumbs up after thumbs up after thumbs up. How many times are you going to see a Daytona in Springfield, Oregon? Not, not too often. Not too often. Truly what we did was we transformed a car from a withering rust heap of nothing to a first place, show winning, stunning representation of 1969. So with sincerely all jokes aside, okay. thank You're you welcome, very, man. very much. It's been fun. It was hard to believe that, okay, this is my car. Adios Tom, adios Daytona. Welcome back, low build pressure. <laughs> we spent five years dedicated to making a program and restoring the cars at the same time so that we could share our passion with the world. And that's all I ever wanted to do. Say it with me at the same time on three. Graveyard cars. One, two, three. Graveyard, Graveyard cars. cars. Graveyard cars. <laughs> <laughs>